Hello and praise the Lord, everybody. I'm Pastor Joshua Glick. And I'm Leah Glick. And we're part of the Journey Up Church. We're so excited to have each and every one of you join us here today for another edition of our cyber service. If you enjoyed today's service or if it ministered to you in any way, please feel free to like it, comment, reach out to us. Um, if you feel like someone else could use it, please feel free to share it. And more importantly, if you need a Bible study or would like to learn more about God, reach out to us. We would be more than happy to sit down with you and talk about God and, and just go on this journey with you. And for our Journey Up family, we now also have the ability to give online. And so to do that, you can go to our website at Our Journey Up. Dot org. We pray today that this message blesses you and go with God in Jesus' name. Well, hello there and praise the Lord, everybody. I want to welcome each and every one of you again to another cyber study here with the Journey Up Church. I'm the lead pastor, Joshua Glick, and it's so good to be with each and every one of you again this evening to dig a little bit deeper into the Word of God. I hope each and every one of you all are ready. And so uh, we are going to be starting off here this evening on uh, Lesson 4, which is going to uh, be titled, God Sends a Deliverer, uh, just starting off talking about the life of Moses. And so uh, hopefully this is somewhat of a familiar story uh, for each and every one of you all, but it's a great uh, uh, depiction not only of the deliverance of uh, the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but also there's some great parallels as well as far as a child of God's uh, deliverance from out of this world and into the hands of Jesus Christ. And so uh, it's going to be a great lesson here this evening, and I pray that it's going to be a blessing for you as well. But before we start, why don't we just uh, gather together, let's pray, and let's ask that God would be in the midst of this Bible study uh, here this evening. God, we love you, Jesus, and we thank you so much, God, for your delivering power. Thank you for your word, God, and for your truth. And I pray, Lord, that your word, God, would speak to us tonight. I pray, Lord, that you would teach this lesson, Lord, and, and you would lead us and guide us, Lord God, down the paths of your truth. God, I pray that you bless each and every individual as they would partake of this lesson here this evening. God, and I pray that you would open their minds to revelation and open their hearts to receive this great word. I pray, God, that in the name of Jesus Christ, we love you, we praise you, and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, and amen. Hallelujah. Like I said, we are on lesson four here, and we are looking at chart one that's titled, God Sends a Deliverer. Now, Lessons 1 and 3 was all just about one book, and that was the book of Genesis. And we finally get to leave the book of Genesis here, starting with Lesson 4. And uh, um, Exodus, the book of Exodus, which is what we're basically going to be covering here today, describes the exit or the departure from Egypt. And the next, let me back up to say the, the, the next books here that we're going to be covering, uh, the first five books of the Bible is considered by theologians as the what's called the Pentateuch, or what's called the Book of the Law. And it's books that were written by Moses, and it covers from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and the Book of Deuteronomy. And like I said, Exodus describes the exit or the departure out of Israel from the land of Egypt, which is basically what we're going to be talking here tonight. But just laying a foundation here, Leviticus uh, relates to the Levites, a tribe uh, of Israel. And it teaches the book of Leviticus teaches the holiness of God and how to uh, properly approach God. The book of Numbers is so named because of the Israelite fighting force was twice numbered. It was numbered in uh, Numbers chapter 1, verses 2 through 46, and chapter 26 verses 2 through 51. And this book, the book of Numbers, describes Israel's 40-year wilderness journey at Sinai. It talks about their murmurings. It talks about their unbelief. Just uh, it chronicles, if you will, uh, of their plight or their uh, journey uh, to Sinai. Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, that's called the second law. And it records Moses' farewell address. And this book prepared Israel to enter into the promised land and encouraged them to renew 
their covenant, their relationship with God. Now, the book of Exodus, which is what we're talking about here in Lesson 4 today, uh, the book of Exodus opens with God's covenant people awaiting deliverance from being in the middle of a pagan land. And as we begin this practical study of uh, the everyday life, the struggles and the temptations of the Israelites, I want us all to remember here tonight that God is not nearly so concerned with what we go through in life as He is concerned in how we respond to life's varied situations. Will we rebel in life, just like the Israelites, or will we complain and criticize, or will we allow God to be the Lord and the ruler of our lives? It's not about what we go through or the situations and the trials that come upon us, but God is much more concerned about whether or not we're going to be remain obedient to God through those trials. Now, in each of the people of Israel's difficulties, imagine yourself to be in Israel's place. What would you do in their situation? How would you respond to the problems that they went through? Could you be patient and understanding, or would you also be like them, overcome with doubts and unbelief in the midst of the, the almost impossible situations that they were put through? But why were, why were the Israelites involved? Why were they there in Egypt? Uh, did a loving God intend for His chosen ones to be cruelly treated and enslaved? Had Israel and his sons remained in grand... Uh, in, in, uh, had Israel and his sons remained in grandfather Abraham's promised land, they would have died. They would have died in a severe famine, in a severe drought. Uh, we talked a little bit about the story in our previous lessons. But in Egypt, there God had blessed them and planted them there in Egypt uh, by the hand of Joseph. And it was there where they had flourished into a large nation. Fulfilling the promise that was made to Abraham, they had begun to multiply and as the stars of heaven and as the sands of the seashore there in Egypt. God, God continued to bless them even in a strange land. In fact, Exodus chapter 1 and verse 7 says, And the children of Israel were fruitful, and they increased abundantly and multiplied, and they waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. So why then should the Israelites endure oppression and slavery. I believe that God's purpose was to illustrate the benefits associated with affliction. Yeah, I'm going to rewind and say that statement one more time because that was not, that was not a false statement. That was not an error in, in reading the lesson here tonight. God's purpose was to illustrate the benefits associated with affliction. You see, slavery toughened the Israelites for the wilderness journey ahead of them, and it weaned them from Egypt's prosperity. Without, just think about it for a moment. Without persecution, Israel might have never departed from their adopted land. They might have missed the whole promise that God had ultimately in store for them had they would just, if they would have just grown comfortable in the land of Egypt. If they, would, if they would never have had a desire to leave, uh, they would have missed some of the greatest promises and blessings that God still had yet in store for them. So as the whips of the Egyptian taskmasters lashed across their backs, I can imagine that thoughts of Canaan became more and more enticing. As, as they were uh, uh, in the hands of bondage and slavery in the, in the land of Egypt, I can imagine that God was, was uh, uh, how should I say it, was uh, moving them from their comfort zones, moving them from the place where they were accustomed to, from their normalcy, from what they had grown used to in their life, from what they was comfortable with. God was moving them from that state of being comfortable to now wanting to move on to a new land, to move out of that land of affliction and then God could then move them to that land where He has promised for them to be. As the Hebrew slaves became more miserable, I could imagine their sighs and cries blended into a groan. And God 
began to hear their groaning. God began to hear their hearts cry through the midst of their affliction. You see, suffering, let me pause just to make a note here. Suffering has the special quality of refining the heart. David said this in Psalms 119 and 67. He said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. David was saying before he was ever afflicted, then his heart turned away from God. Then he somehow uh, uh, fallen short of, or, or, or wandered away from God. But now that since he's kept, but now uh, have I kept thy word, he says. In other words, through his affliction, through his trials, uh, somehow that turned him back onto the right track with God. And we know the story of David, how God wrought many miracles in David's life and for him, for he himself to become a mighty king, one of the greatest kings uh, um, within the nation of Israel. But do you suppose that 21st century pressures and problems in our own lives also might be toughening us, might be uh, uh, preparing us, if you will, for troublesome times ahead? Paul reminded us this in Romans chapter 8 and verses 28. He says that, you will, many of you all know this verse, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good. Yes, even those moments of trials, even those moments of wanderings in your life, even those moments of even affliction or persecution, all things work together for your good, to those that are called according to God's purpose, according to God's sign. If you are willing to keep and to put your trust, faith, and hope in God, yes, my friend, even those bad times, God can turn around for your good. Oh, I've seen it happen over and over again, and I rejoice in that fact today. That gives me hope. That gives me uh, a, a certain element of certainty in my life to keep on pressing forward and keeping my faith in God no matter what comes my way. Why? Because all things work together for good. Amen. You can still put your trust in Jesus, even in the midst of a situation where it seems like you are enslaved, even in a situation where it seems like you are trapped, you don't know the answer, you don't know the way out in maybe your situation, but my friend, God is preparing you for deliverance. God is preparing you for a testimony, for victory in your life, if you keep your faith and hope in God. Amen. Somebody give me an amen on that. That's good. That's good teaching. That's a little nugget right there that you can take to you all the way to heaven's gates. Amen. In Jesus' name, all things work together. You see, Satan had sought to destroy the promised seed of the woman, knowing that Abraham had been uh, specified uh, in that lineage. The enemy determined to destroy his descendants. And when a Pharaoh came to the throne who knew not Joseph, this was now the devil's chance. It was his opportunity to destroy that line, that lineage. And fearing that the Israelites would join with an enemy king in a time of war, uh, the Pharaoh oppressed, he began to oppress the Israelites, hoping to stunt their rapid growth, hoping to stunt their multiplication. But during strenuous labor, they indeed had multiplied. And then the Hebrew midwives were then ordered uh, to kill every male child at birth. But they feared God. Thank God the, the midwives feared God. And they would not obey the commandment of Pharaoh. Oh, hallelujah. I thank God for men and women of God that fear the Lord more than they fear man. I thank God for a few saints within the Journey Up Church that fear God more than they fear man, that are willing to stand for God and His righteousness no matter what happens in this crazy old world. But we are determined in our hearts and lives to live for God. Praise the Lord. Uh, uh, finally, Pharaoh, what he decided to then do was command the Egyptians to report the birth of male Hebrew babies, whereupon the infants would be drowned into the Nile River. But ironically, the same measure chosen to destroy Israel, it affected their deliverance. You see, all things work together for good. 
to them that are called according to his purpose. Even the thing that Pharaoh put into effect was ultimately leading to the deliverance of Israel. About this time, Amran and Jochebed, a godly couple of the tribe of Levi, they were blessed with a fine baby boy. Something about this tiny son seemed very special. They saw he was a proper child, according to Hebrews 11.23, and they determined not to throw him in the Nile, but they determined to keep him. And after concealing their baby at home for three months, Jochebed constructed a small chest-like ark made of bulrushes or papyrus plants, and they sealed it with pitch. And her son became the ark's precious cargo, laid among the reeds along the banks of the Nile. And this tiny little ark was then strategically placed where the princess usually bathed. Miriam, that was the name of the child's sister, she was instructed to watch. And when the baby began to cry on that Nile River, motherly instincts were instantly aroused in the princess of Egypt's heart. She determined to rescue for herself this one lone stranded Hebrew boy. And so quickly, Miriam, who was watching this all take place, she offered to find a, a nursemaid. And Moses' own mother then received wages for doing what pleased her the most. Hallelujah, that's another testimony within itself. And God can still do that in our lives today. Uh, provide miracles in our lives amongst oppressive situations. But Moses' most beneficial uh, uh, education was from his God-fearing parents. Now, take note that the name of Moses literally meant, I drew him out of the water. That's what Moses means. And Moses learned precious truths and stories as he was uh, weaned and nurtured by his own mother. Uh, I believe he learned precious truths and stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. No doubt Jochebed impressed upon her own son that soon they would leave this terrible place of slavery to possess the promised land. Now in the East, children are usually nursed for, th for the first three years. And Moses' mother had a short time, just a quick three-year period to begin teaching her son. But it was his only parental instruction about God's ways. That time he was able to spend with Jochebed. The child was adopted by the princess and, and given a royal education. Moses' parents had hoped only that he live. But neither did they even dream that he would become a great and a wise, and a rich, and a well-educated, and powerful young man. A prince of Egypt he was. Thus, God turned Satan's evil scheme to be the means of deliverance for his chosen people. You see why? Because all things work together for good. Oh, hallelujah. You sense a recurring theme here? Uh, uh, God turned Satan's evil scheme to be the means of deliverance. For his chosen people, Pharaoh provided Pharaoh provided free lodging and education to the very man who would accomplish what Pharaoh was trying to prevent. My God, not only did God uh, use Moses to deliver uh, the children of Israel from the hands of Egypt, but he used the enemy's provisions to do it with. Hallelujah. Is that a miracle upon a miracle? My God, that, that makes me excited. But from Adam to Christ, no one has accomplished more than Moses. Moses is among the few Bible characters whose life is sketched, talked about from his very birth to his very death. God's early dealings with Israel were transacted as Yahweh spoke face to face with his prophet, priest, and king. As Moses matured to adulthood, he surely dreamed of ascending up to Egypt's throne and instantly liberating his enslaved people. But such was not God's way. You see, that would have made sense. But how many of you all know here today that God's ways are not our ways? Our thoughts are not God's thoughts. In my own mind's eye, I would have said of God, it was a tremendous miracle for God to place a, an Israelite to the 
to be a potential seat of the king of the Egyptian people. I thought that would have been the logical way. That would have been the, 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 the logical means for Moses to be able to deliver the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. But no, God had another plan. God had another way, and His ways are always better. We've got to learn to trust in Him, folks, even in our own lives and situations today. But once while visiting a royal construction project, the young Hebrew observed the inhuman treatment of his people. What should he do? What would Moses do? Should he ignore their plight to seek his own fame and prestige among the Egyptians? Few people have had to make Moses' decision. They, they ha uh, it would equal rejecting the presidency of the United States or the throne of England to associate yourself with a chain gang or, or a prison farm. Remembering his mother's teaching, Moses made the wisest choice of his life. It's recorded in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 through 26. It says this, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. And having made that decision, at the age of 40 years old, Moses launched into his role of deliverer, but without divine mission or command. In retribution to merciless treatment of his kinsmen, Moses reacted and killed an Egyptian taskmaster. And he, then he hid the body in a shallow grave to try to hide his transgression. Now, the following day, he tried to settle a Hebrew dispute, and, and one, one Egyptian asked him, he said, do you, do you now intend to kill me as you did that other Egyptian? And with this secret exposed, Moses was compelled to escape for his life. He knew his sin would surely find him out. So what did Moses do? Moses, he ran away. He fled to the land of Midian. And his Egyptian education completed, with all that completed, now he enrolled in, in, the, in God's school. How many, how many know there's a school of learning and then there's a school of God that sometimes God begins to take you through and walk you through? Some people call God, the school of God to be experience, to be lessons learned in life, not through traditional teaching, but just by simply learning the hard way through life. Amen. He's about ready to go through God's school. Praise God. After 40 years, we're spent in, in, in the Sinai, uh, in the Sinai desert as a shepherd. That's where he fled to. Uh, yet he was mastering important leadership qualities for the future, even while shepherding sheep in the Sinai desert. Soon he would lead uh, to this mountain, this Mount Sinai, not a flock of sheep, but he would soon lead a flock of people to Mount Sinai. Upon the same mountain, he would receive one of the greatest revelations that was ever given to man. And toward the end of Moses' exile, another Pharaoh then came to the throne. God was about ready to deliver his people from the land of Egypt. Once while tending his sheep, a spectacular sight arrested Moses' attention while on the backside of that desert. A wild acacia bush was enveloped in flames. He looked at it and turned to it. He noticed that it was consumed with, uh, it was on fire, but it was not being consumed. And as Moses investigated, the angel of the Lord spoke from that burning bush and said, Moses, Moses, do not, do not come near. Put off your shoes, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. You see, Moses, Moses had to learn of God's holiness and that he must always be approached and that God must always be approached with reverence and awe. This was a teaching moment for Moses. Trembling, Moses hid his face. God spoke. He said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I have seen the affliction of my people, and I am come down to deliver them from the hand of the Egyptians and bring them to a land flowing with milk and honey. I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people out of Egypt. Now, delivering Israel was exactly what he had wanted to do for 40 years. But now he felt inferior to the task. Now he felt 
uh, that he himself was somehow unworthy. And graciously, the Lord promised, he said, certainly I will be with thee. Oh, hallelujah. My thought has been upon this for the past several weeks. You know, scripture, uh, Jesus self, himself said in the New Testament, he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Sometimes in life, we ourselves come upon almost seemingly impossible tasks. We come into situations in our life and, and we think, God, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. Or God, I don't know how I'm going to make it through this situation. God, I can't pay these bills. Or God, I, I, I don't know what to do on my job. Or God, uh, I don't know uh, how to uh, uh, handle this situation with my husband or my wife or my family. And, and we get into these situations where it seems like, God, I am unworthy. Or I don't know how to make it out of this situation. But do you know what? Do you know what your soul confidence is to those that are in Christ Jesus? Is a simple promise given by Jesus himself where he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. And that's exactly what God did to Moses. God said to Moses, certainly I will be with thee. And that alone gave Moses the confidence. That alone gave Moses the assurance. What am I trying to say here tonight? I'm trying to say that in your own life, let the fact that God was promised to be with you be your confidence to make it through life's troubles, to make it through the hardships of life. Even as this world tips upside down, it seems, and it, and it seems to, uh, everything seems to be uh, going crazy, if I can uh, uh, put it in that context. Uh, uh, but you can still trust in God. He has promised that He will never leave you nor forsake you. And you never have to fight a battle alone. Just trust in God and God will be on your side. You can make it, my friend. Hallelujah. Somebody give me an amen on that. You can make it. Why? Because God's promised he's never going to leave you or forsake you. And so Moses, Moses questioned what name of authority should be given. And who was this God of his fathers? You see, until then, Moses had been, or excuse me, God had been known as simply El or Elohim or Shaddai or Yahweh. There's a lot of different names that was provided, but they were more referenced as not as a name, but more as an attribute possessed by God. You so you see, um, his new name would be, as expressed at the burning bush, I am that I am, meaning he who alone exists. In other words, the great I am, or the one God. He said he was he who alone exists, meaning that there is no other God. There is just but one Lord. Hallelujah. I thank God in that. After centuries... Yahweh introduced himself as a personal, loving being, ready to fulfill uh, the covenant promises. And every new revelation of God's name from this time forward provides a, a fuller, a richer, maybe a, even a clearer understanding of who God was. Uh, Yahweh Jireh, Yahweh Nissi, Yahweh Shalom. Each compounded name revealed such attributes as maybe his provision or his righteousness or his healing or his peace and, and other attributes as well. But when Moses' self inadequacy I can't even hardly talk tonight. When Moses' self-inadequacy persisted, God furnished a threefold symbolical reply that would silence his critics and encourage Moses himself. For the very first time, a man was empowered to draw attention to God's greatness through the working of miracles. The first time, this is the first instance that God began to uh, uh, show his omnipotence, his all-powerful. Ness. God commanded Moses to throw his ordinary shepherd's staff onto the ground. And most of you all are familiar with this story. And when it became a serpent, he fled in terror. I probably would have well as well. But at God's command, he then ran over to that snake. He grabs, grasped that serpent by the tail, and it then became a rod again in Moses' hand. The second sign involved Moses' hand. First, Moses' hand became leprous, and then Moses put it uh, in, in his coverings again, and then it was cleansed. 
And the third sign was power was provided to Moses to turn the Nile water into blood. And to Moses' excuse of having a speech defect or a speech impediment, the Lord then uh, appointed Aaron, Moses' brother, as a spokesman for Moses. With the divine commission, Moses then returned to Egypt with his wife and with his two sons. Before reaching his destination, however, Moses learned another very important lesson, that the covenant sign of circumcision had been neglected in one of his own sons. While the family lodged for the night, Moses was suddenly stricken ill as the Lord sought to kill him. That was found in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 24. When he and his wife perceived the purpose for the sickness, Zipporah, Moses' wife herself, performed the ritual rite. And as soon as his son was circumcised, immediately Moses then recovered. To be a lawgiver and a leader, you see, Moses must observe what God first commanded to Abraham without circumcision or without that blood covenant. And if you have any questions, any more on that blood covenant, you can just refer back to my prior lessons. But without the blood covenant, an Israelite was alienated from God. But back in Egypt, the two brothers met with the elders of Israel to deliver a divine message. And the time had finally arrived to leave Egypt for their long-promised home. And then began the mightiest conflict in history. On one side was arrayed the power, the wealth, and the splendor of Egypt and its paganism. And on the other hand was the, was the poor and the aged and the discredited man and his brother. And through the palace gates they went, Moses and Aaron, asking the king to liberate three million people. Can you imagine that? Uh, at first the Egyptians must have scoffed. They probably laughed and ridiculed Moses and Aaron, but soon their laughter would be turned to anxiety and then to pounding fear. Uh, haughtily, uh, Pharaoh said this in Exodus 5 and 2. He said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I know not the Lord, and neither will I let Israel go. Now, unrelenting, Moses and Aaron presented persuasive reasons, but the pair were uh, accused of inciting Hebrew laborers to discontent. And therefore, the labor on the Israelites was doubled by Pharaoh. Formerly, straw and, uh, uh, had been provided uh, for their building resources, but now they had to go out and find the, the straw or the hay or the stubble themselves to go make the bricks to build uh, buildings for the Egypt. Now, no, incidentally, archaeologists have uncovered Egyptian buildings with bricks made of stubble rather than straw, as was recorded in Exodus chapter 5 and verse 12. Doubtless, this book was written by somebody who knew the facts. Hey, man. Often the path to deliverance winds through the valley of deeper trouble. Can somebody, can somebody just say amen to that? I'm going to read that again. That's a great set, uh, sentence. Often the path to deliverance winds through the valley of deeper trouble. You see, why is that? It's because our ways are not God's ways. Our thoughts are not God's thoughts. It seems like our path, you know, we can map that out in our mind, but oftentimes the path to deliverance in our own lives winds through the valley of deeper trouble, it seems. But God instructed Moses to quit begging, quit pleading. Deliverance strategy was about to commence. Moses and Aaron would contend against the gods of Egypt and the magical heathen arts. And when Pharaoh demanded to see a miracle, Aaron then threw Moses' rod to the ground and it became a serpent. The sorcerers and the magicians performed a similar feat. But Upon uh, observation, Aaron's rod began to swallow up the rods of the uh, Egyptian magicians. And had he chosen to, the Lord could have instantly slain Pharaoh, I believe, and all of his people. But instead, God patiently exhibited supernatural power to prove the inferiority of the gods of Egypt and that he alone was worthy to be worshipped. You see, Pharaoh had inquired, Who is the Lord? I know not the Lord. But after the completion of these ten plagues are about to happen, the two 
would be well acquainted. Pharaoh would be very well acquainted with who the God of the Israelites is. See, Egyptian gods differed from deities of surrounding countries. Egypt's idolatrous religion was morally and spiritually degrading. Each Egyptian god and goddess was depicted having human bodies with animal heads. The bull, the lion, ram, the cat, wolf, dogs, uh, vultures, falcons, crocodiles, cobras, frogs, locusts, and other animals and insects were considered sacred in Egypt. Unlike other eastern rulers, the Egyptian pharaoh did not rule for the gods, but he was literally considered to be a god himself. Naturally, a request for Israel's release would be rejected. Now, the first plague uh, occurred as Pharaoh was offering his customary worship to the sacred Nile that was considered to be the father of life. Emphatically, Moses announced that his people must be released or the Nile, the father of life, would be turned to blood. As Aaron stretched his rod over the Nile, every canal and pond and container of stored water turned into blood. The whole population would have soon died of thirst. So Pharaoh's magicians counterfeited this miracle, but they were powerless to change the blood-red Nile back to its original condition. For seven days, the river, once once defiled with the blood of innocent Hebrew babies, was now a mass of stinking pollution. Then, unexpectedly, God withdrew the plague. The consequence for Pharaoh's next refusal, the second plague, was an epidemic of frogs. Deified as a goddess, the presence of small croaking frogs normally assured the Egyptians of a good harvest. But this epidemic greatly interrupted the comfort and the happiness of the extremely clean Egyptians. The sacred, these sacred little creatures could not be killed as they were uh, everywhere. They were everywhere. They were in the houses. They were in the beds. They were in the kneading troughs. They were in the ovens. They were everywhere. And Pharaoh's magicians did the same with their enchantments, but they were powerless to remove again the plague. In desperation, Mer- uh, Pharaoh promised that if Moses and Aaron's God would prevent the plague, they could go and then offer their sacrifices. His knowledge of the Lord <laughs> seemed to be improving. Pharaoh seemed to be kind of getting to be acquainted with the God of the Israelites. But when the plague ended and the heaps of the frogs were then buried, Pharaoh turned around. He denied his promise. So the third plague came along. The third plague was swarmed Egypt. As Aaron's rod struck the ground, Scripture says the dust turned to gnats an almost invisible insect with a very annoying sting. Authorities believe that lice should have been translated as gnats or even mosquitoes could have been translated as gnats. Egypt's fertile, uh, worshipped soil had become a curse. Man and beast were driven to madness by these tiny little pests. But when Pharaoh assembled the magicians, the contest then ended. Humbly, they confessed this miracle to be the finger of God. And next came the plague of flies, the fourth plague. From this plague, the Israelites and their property were protected. In despair, Pharaoh offered a compromise of allowing the people to go a short distance. But when the flies were gone, he again changed his mind. A highly contagious Cattle disease then came as the fifth plague that infected all the cattle. It affected cattle and horses and donkeys, oxen, and even the sheep. All livestock in the field that was in the open air died. And although the Egyptian cows and bulls and rams and goats were considered sacred, their gods were helpless to defend them from this judgment. But not one head of cattle in Israel was affected or killed. Still, Pharaoh refused to allow Israel's freedom. And so, as Moses and Aaron threw ashes heavenward, then here we find the sixth plague moving forward. In the sixth plague, there were open, running boils appeared upon man and upon beasts. Even Pharaoh's magicians were too grotesque to answer his call in an open royal court. 
The next plague, the seventh plague, was an unprecedented violent hailstorm, a peculiar electrical display similar to fireballs and hail filled all the land except for the land of Goshen. Flax and barley crops were totally destroyed, and the sky goddess was unable to intervene. So impressed was Pharaoh by this hail, he confessed. He said, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. That's found in Exodus chapter 9, verse 27. However, when Moses raised his hands in the rain, hail and thunder ceased. Pharaoh's penance and promises were broken. Patiently, Moses issued a new warning on the eighth plague, and Pharaoh continued to balk. Uh, so on the eighth plague, locusts would now infest the earth. Royal servants joined the plea this time to release the people, but only an empty compromise was given, then again withdrawn. You see, locust plagues were so fearsome in the ancient Egypt that peasants prayed to the locust god. A locust can daily eat its own weight in volume. One square mile might contain 100 to 200 million insects and a swarm might occupy an area of 400 square miles. That's crazy to imagine. So Egypt's crops and their fruits and their trees were all stripped down to trunks and limbs. But when a strong west wind drove them back into the Red Sea, Pharaoh then canceled the release of the Israelites. And then the ninth judgment... The Lord fought the entire host of divinities. You see, Re, which was the sun god, was Egypt's most superior god. And as Moses stretched his hand toward heaven, Scripture says a thick darkness that could be felt covered the land. Exodus chapter 10 and verse 21. For three days, the Egyptians suffered severe mental anguish. However, the Israelites furnished with plenty of light were preparing for the greatest event of their lives. To Pharaoh's call, Moses and Aaron rejected another compromise, but they announced the final plague, it, the tenth plague, and it was the death to the firstborn of man and beast alike. Moses predicted the exact hour, the anguish, and the ultimate expulsion of the Israelites from Egypt. This was going to be the final stroke that was going to set Israel free. And, we, and while Egypt was under a plague of thick darkness, Israelites busily prepared to initiate, to initiate a new ordinance. This new ordinance was called the Passover. And I want to take a little bit of time on this, and I'm about ready to wrap all this up, but just a little bit more time to talk about the Passover because it's so significant to even our own present day in living for God. The Passover is more frequently mentioned in the New Testament than any other ordinance. In the old, this new decree would be uh, emphasized by a calendar change. Israel's month of Abib, which was later changed to the month of Nisan, would be the beginning of months. Abib is the month of Abib is the same month as our month of April. And as the last and most dreadful plague was being readied, God introduced the plan whereby He would redeem man from sin, the blood of atonement, meaning to cover man's sins. Notice in the Passover story the many comparisons with the coming of the Lamb of God. You see, God instructed in the Passover that a selected lamb would be offered as a substitute for the firstborn child. The lamb must be an unblemished year-old male. Uh, to ensure its perfect condition, it must be pinned up for four days, and then it had to be inspected. Each lamb must be killed in the evening and roasted with fire. All the flesh must be eaten with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. If one lamb was too much for a family to eat, it must be shared with another household to prevent waste. And as they ate, everybody, everyone must stand around the table clad with shoes and staves, ready to for travel. No Israelite could leave the house until morning. Only inside a home protected by the lamb's blood would they be safe. Before eating the meal, each family leader must sprinkle the lamb's blood on the two posts and lintel of the doorway. Animal blood had no, you see, animal blood had no innate cleansing power, but it declared the necessity of a blood covering. 
for sin, for atonement, to cover their sins. The entire Passover story illustrated that Christ would be sent to earth as God's perfect lamb. It was his sins, his sinless blood, that would cover and cleanse us from sin. I I think I said that wrong. I said his sins. God was sinless, but it was his uh, shedding of blood, him becoming the, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. It was the blood that he would shed that would cover our sins. Amen. And uh, uh, and provide us uh, the remission of sins. As Paul wrote this in Hebrews 9 and 26, he said, Once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Oh, praise God. At midnight, the Lord himself went through the land, executing judgment against the firstborn in all the gods of Egypt, Exodus 12, 12. Only those, protect, only those protected by the blood would that death angel pass over. And only those today that are protected by the blood of the Lamb. How do you get the blood of the Lamb applied to your life today? The blood of the Lamb is applied, first of all, by repentance of your sins, and then by being baptized in the name of of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Hallelujah. That's where that's where the blood is applied. And an angry God was in the streets that night in the land of Egypt. In a sense, all the firstborn were slain, both, both in Israel and in, in Egypt. In other words, a death angel passed through both camps. But the Egyptian firstborn all died in person, while the Israelite firstborn were redeemed because of a substituted sacrificial lamb, because they had the blood on their doorpost, because they had a covering, if you will. And us today, hallelujah, we are going to be spared the judgment of God. Praise God to those that have the blood of that sacrificial lamb applied to your lives, the blood of Jesus Christ applied to our lives. Amen, at baptism. You see, from Pharaoh's palace to the humblest shack, every firstborn died that didn't have the blood applied to them, even the beasts. Most temples housed sacred animals that were worshipped as gods. The revered Apis bull at Memphis probably fell dead, along with other animal gods. The death of Pharaoh's own son shocked the palace servants. And there lay a pale, lifeless form of the boy who supposedly was born of the gods. Finally, Pharaoh's stubborn will was broken. And calling for Moses and Aaron, he urged Israel to to leave and to leave immediately. No compromises. There were no qualifications, no stipulations. All of the people must exit with their flocks and their herds. And that commandment was now. At God's command, the Israelites went to their Egyptian neighbors and they borrowed, or more correctly, requested jewels of silver and gold and clothing from their neighbors. Anything to remove these mysterious Israelites far out of their sight. They gave them whatever they wanted. Just get out of this land. Remove these plagues from us. And God had previously said to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verses 21 through 22, he said this, And I will give this this people favor in in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall come to pass that when ye go, ye shall not go empty, but every woman shall borrow of her neighbor jewels of silver, jewels of gold and raiment, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. You see, the conquering nation was awarded the spoils of her enemy that night. However, in exchange for a century of slavery, it was probably a relatively very small payment. Would they really need such wealth? Would they really need that gold and the the jewels? Would they really need all of those things as they uh, uh, moved out of Egypt? Absolutely. Absolutely. Much of that gold and much of that silver would be used to construct the tabernacle. Jewels would adorn the garments of the high priest. Instead of leaving 
Instead of the Israelites leaving as fugitives, they marched out of the land of Egypt like conquerors, dressed in splendor. Hallelujah. Victory was theirs. And victory can be yours today in Jesus Christ. Well, we, except what do we have to do? We just have to learn to trust in God. Lean not into our own understanding, but acknowledge Him, knowing that He will direct our paths. And remember, all things work together for good to them who are called according to His purpose. Don't, don't ever question what God's doing in your life. Just trust Him. Lean upon Him. Learn to, to hear that still, small voice as God speaks to you in your life. And He will lead you to the victory. He will lead you with splendor. Amen. Victory is God's. Amen. And if we learn to follow Him, then victory is yours as well. In Jesus' name. Oh, thank you, God. I thank you, Lord, for the victory. I thank you, Lord, for the promises that you have given unto your people. I thank you, God, tonight that you will never leave me or forsake me, that you have promised to stick closer to me than a brother. God, I thank you, God. That gives me the confidence tonight to weather the storm, God, to face the mountain in my life and to put my whole trust in you. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for your assurance. I thank you, God, for this precious lesson tonight. And I pray, God, that you would bless your people. Bless those, God, that have taken the time to listen to this lesson. And I pray, God, your spirit would go with them this week as we learn to journey and to march forward in you. In Jesus' name we pray. And amen. Praise God. Well, God bless each and every one of you. I love you. Thank you for taking the time to uh, view another cyber study here with us. And I pray that this week be a, a, a blessing as well for you. If you serve a great God, be great to those around you. In Jesus' name.